Ready? Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Les Jones. I'm a business development manager with Careflex. I'm hoping you can all hear us. Just to let you know, um, you may want to turn your video stream off and turn your mic off because we're recording the session. Okay, so just to let you know, and it doesn't come as a surprise. Um, if I can just give you a little bit about the structure of the next hour, we'll spend um, some time with Rebecca going through some theory. This is Rebecca. Hi. Um, we'll then come back to myself. I'll do some practical with the chairs and the seating, and we'll try to blend the theory and the practical together. Um, just to let you know, we'll be providing you with a copy of the presentation as well. Uh, so make as many notes as you like, but you will get a copy. There'll also be a CPD certificate as well at the end. Um, we'll, we'll cover that again as we get towards the end of the, the presentation. So if I just pass you across to Rebecca. Yeah, uh, just to mention as well that um, we're going to be going through the presentation, the theory, and I know we are providing it, uh, the copy to you. If you have any questions, and um, then if you could just leave it just for the smoothness of the of, yeah. the, of the day, if you could just leave it till the end when we do the question and answer session, uh, make a note of the slide number if you like, um, and then we'll address it all or use the yeah. chat system as well. And Alex, who was with us in the, in the background, can um, keep track of that. Yeah, that's fine. Lovely. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. So as Les said, my name is Rebecca. I am a clinical specialist at Careflex. I am a physiotherapist by profession and I was fortunate when I graduated that I specialised straight away into neurology and learning disabilities. So posture management has really been a passion of mine throughout my whole career. And as Les mentioned, we're going to be looking just at the theory this morning. I was a lot of information to get through in 45 minutes. Um, so if you do want any more in-depth information or any client specific queries, um, then you can always contact us or email us um, at any point and we can address those specifically with you. OK, so the role of specialist seating in COVID-19 recovery. Undoubtedly, COVID-19 has affected us all in some way or another whether we've had to fight the virus ourselves or we've seen health conditions deteriorate in response or we've even had to cope with the effects of lockdown on our well-being. We are now navigating the easing of restrictions and a gradual return to our new normal, this new buzzword, uh, but we cannot forget the many thousands of individuals still impacted by COVID and more than likely the type of clients that we are going to get referred to us um, and the type of clients that we might see an increase um, in need going forward, especially with postural management, which I'll explain in a bit more detail. So this virus is new um, and our understanding of it is continuously evolving and evidence regarding this long term impact is limited. But clinicians and scientists across the world are now working hard to find out what happens to people as they recover. Recent publications from the NHS and professional bodies like the CSP and RCOT make it clear that the pandemic will be affecting individuals recovering from COVID-19 for a long time to come. It's important to remember with regards to COVID-19 recovery that everyone's individual experience is unique and many people will thankfully make a full recovery. But for some people, COVID-19 can cause symptoms that last weeks or even months after the infection is gone. And we tend to hear this referred as long COVID or post-COVID-19 syndrome. Now, today's session, we're going to be focusing on the challenges that we might see during recovery. Uh, it's expected that people recovering will present with these following three challenges. And we've chosen these three because they have a, can have a significant impact on a person's ability to achieve good seated posture. So first of all, the main topic for this session, fatigue. It is a common challenge that's reported by individuals following a critical care admission, but COVID-19 patients, they seem to be reporting extreme fatigue beyond this usually reported level. And this is likely to then impact both their length of recovery but also they need for support and equipment going forward. The second challenge that we're going to focus on is weakness. And anecdotal evidence suggests that there is a higher than usual incidence of intensive care required weakness, 
in COVID-19 pa patients compared to general critical care population. And this weakness is also being seen in those who become deconditioned from non-critical care stays as well, especially those who are frail. The third challenge is pressure ulcers or pressure injuries. And it is predicted that all COVID-19 patients who need ongoing care will also need ongoing pressure ulcer risk assessments and appropriate therapeutic interventions, which includes pressure redistributing equipment, such as specialist seating. Now, one thing that is certain from this pandemic that it's created this tidal wave of need for rehabilitation. Long after individuals who experience a mild case of the virus recover, many will still be living with the devastating effects. And rehab will be critical for survivors who present with these long-term challenges. Additionally, even though I know we're focusing on COVID-19 and um, the individuals recovering, rehabilitative services will also be needed by those who become deconditioned, maybe as a result of social isolation or reduced access to healthcare with the extra demands on it, for non-COVID-19 conditions too. This rehab will be complex as health and social services face unprecedented challenges. And there'll also be a need for a multidisciplinary holistic approach to recovery because there's going to be a range of different presentations out there and we're not quite sure where that's going to take us yet. So why is rehabilitation important? Well, rehab will be essential in enabling these individuals to reach their full potential and allow them to live their lives to the full. As these waves of inpatients are discharged back into the community, many following long periods in critical care, health and social care services will need to prepare for a whole range of different challenges such as respiratory, musculoskeletal, neurological and psychological. And it's important that this rehab continues along the person's care pathway because any delays and or interruptions has been shown to affect their recovery, their physical, their psychological and their emotional recovery. Now I know today we are focusing on seated posture, um, but as a company we always advocate a regular change of position throughout the full 24 hours. It's believed that many postural challenges begin in lying and are then compounded in sitting. So for example, if an individual sleeps in a fetal position for 14 hours straight at night, how can we then expect them to extend out and sit out comfortably? And regardless of whether or not we are working with clients who have contracted the virus, adhering to important government guidelines throughout the pandemic, such as staying at home, means that we may all be adopting prolonged postures, including myself sitting too much from working from home. But in the clients that we might work with, individuals with conditions that affect their movement, especially those who maybe have difficulty changing their own position, they could therefore be in an increased risk of postural deterioration. It's also worth noting that the social distancing and self-isolation rules that have been in place means that those with complex needs may have been having modified care too, and they may not have been getting the regular and optimum support they need to change position throughout the day and night. So as I mentioned earlier, there could just be this influx of referrals for people who have recovered from COVID-19 or even non-COVID-19 conditions that have deteriorated in response to the pandemic um, with, uh, with the risk of partial deterioration. It's about, uh, about identifying those and getting the piece of equipment in place um, in a timely manner, which I know comes with its own difficulties. But hopefully today we can cover some of those seating solutions um, that will enable us to reduce the risk of these things happening. So why is posture management critical? Well, posture is directly re related to an individual's health, well-being and quality of life. When the body segments are supported, when the pelvis is stable and the trunk and head and limbs are aligned appropriately, all the segments work together efficiently. Now, this good posture is essential for comfort independence and optimum physiological function. We're achieving good posture when we facilitate individuals to perform functionally and with activities of daily living. 
It means that they are energy efficient, so they're not fatiguing quickly and they're able to sit out for a defined period of time and interact with their environment. Good posture also means that we are reducing the risk of harm to the body systems, so reducing the risk of secondary complications such as ill health from poor physiological function or um, contractures from not supporting the body segments appropriately. And specialist seating aims to meet this objective by offering a solution for balancing these four key considerations that we feel are needed when choosing a chair. So comfort, independence and function, postural control and pressure redistribution. Ultimately, and we'll, this will, we'll go into a bit more detail when um, we do the practical element, but ultimately we want the body segments to be fully supported with the body weight distributed evenly throughout the chair. And when this works well, and when seating is used appropriately, we are promoting comfort and relaxation for our clients. We're hopefully decreasing fatigue. So that obviously is a crucial element when we're looking at fatigue management. We're providing a stable base of support, which will allow functional movement at, at the upper limbs. We'll be facilitating normal movement patterns or hopefully controlling any abnormal movement patterns such as uh, reflexes and involuntary movements. We'll be preventing, delaying or accommodating postural deterioration depending on the stage that the client is at. And we'll be doing this either through correcting posture or accommodating it depending on their postural assessment. We'll be looking to enhance physiological functions such as respiration, digestion, promoting good health and well-being, and then looking at the psychological impact as well, improving engagement and interaction and social inclusion, which at the moment is crucial to people's well-being when maybe they're not allowed to go out and about either for shielding or from self-isolating. So going back to the three key challenges that we're covering today, fatigue. So now everyone experiences tiredness at times, especially me with a toddler at home, but this can be relieved by sleep and rest. Fatigue is when this tiredness is so overwhelming and it can't be relieved by sleep and rest. And sometimes it's referred to as exhaustion or reduced energy. Now, post-viral fatigue is common and it's just a normal part of the body's response to fighting a viral infection such as COVID. It normally settles after a few weeks. However, in some people, it can persist for longer. And fatigue can affect all aspects of our clients' lives. It can restrict their ability to engage in daily living and have a negative impact on them psychologically. It can leave people feeling dull and they can find it difficult to concentrate or recall memories. With fatigue and posture, they are interlinked. So fatigue itself can have a significant impact on a person's ability to sit upright but also poor posture, let's call it, can have an impact on fatigue. So it's vital that we understand both and how to manage them. Fatigue can be associated with scoliosis, an increased thoracic kyphosis, contractures and pelvic instability, including a posterior pelvic tilt. Poor posture makes inefficient use of the body structure and puts these extra demands on it. The muscles then tire more quickly because they have to work harder to remain upright, which results in greater energy consumption and results in our clients becoming fatigued. Early implementation of fatigue management strategies will be critical in these cases. I think it can reduce the impact that it has, but also the risk of it becoming a chronic problem. And if we manage a person's posture through appropriate seating, which we'll cover shortly, it can promote energy conservation and make it easier for them to live a meaningful life and complete activities of daily living. It can enable them to maintain this optimal sitting position for a defined period of time with the pelvis stable and the trunk in midline, hopefully encouraging these body segments to work efficiently. And it's also really important to consider the frequency and the duration of the chair use as well within that 24 hour period. The second challenge that we looked at was weakness. I was already mentioned 
this post viral recovery can be associated with generalized weakness. And this means that individuals might find it difficult to stand or even sit upright for long periods of time, especially individuals who may have become deconditioned. Gravitational forces can make it sit in effortful for them, for those who present with muscle weakness or lack postural control. Now, this prolonged abnormal postures as a result of generalized weakness, especially if they can't change their position, will create more tension on the body and increase the risk of contractures and deformities, which then leads to pain and further impact on fatigue. So it can be this vicious cycle. A decline in muscle mass and strength is also linked to increased falls, functional decline and increased mobility. So we, men we mentioned this word quite a lot at CareFlex, but it's about thinking holistically, thinking about the client as a whole person and how that chair will fit in, but also what else can we do throughout the full 24 hours to promote good posture at all times. And that might mean periods of rest and recuperation. And the third challenge is pressure injuries. Now, when these pressure injuries or pressure ulcers occur, they can have a profound impact on our clients' overall well-being because they can be both painful and debilitating. Now, it's well known that many pressure injuries are preventable. Therefore, it's crucial that we are aware of them and to seek support where necessary. Now, appropriate management or better still prevention will ultimately improve our client's quality of life. And a key intervention for prevention is actually pressure redistribution through regular repositioning. And it'd be critical for those at risk because it's believed to be one of the most effective methods for preventing skin damage. And as we talk through the practical session, we can just um, demonstrate how um, seating can play a crucial role within that pressure redistribution. So what I'll do now then is call Led back um, and we'll just run through the practical elements and tie all that back into COVID-19 recovery and some of the challenges we might come across as we go forward. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to use um, four chairs from the, the CareFlex range, ranging from um, mild, moderate, so that to complex in terms of what we can do with postural support. So we look at things like pelvic stability. We look at the effects of tilt and space and back angle recline. We also look at the pressure care system that we use within our chairs. So if I start with perhaps the most common form of specialist seating, and that's a lift and recline chair. Uh, within the CareFlex range, we have three chairs, um, the Dartington, the Ashburton, and the Kingsbridge. This chair is called the Kingsbridge. Across the range, we can cope with an upper weight limit of up to 70 stone, a seat width of 32 inches, and a seat depth of 24 inches. Now, there's an awful lot of cover in the next 20 minutes or so. So I would suggest, um, yeah, make plenty of notes, but our website's a great resource to go and look at these products in a bit more detail and to understand the, um, the core, if you like, the basics of uh, specialist seating and postural support. So what we have here is a what we call a single motor lift and recline chair. What that means is the action given is called tilt in space. So the back the seat angle remains constant. And that's what we look for in, with, with pelvic stability. Yeah, once we get that pelvis in a supportive, neutral posture, we don't want to affect that. Okay. There's another option with a lift and recline chair called a dual motor, and that dual motor will give you the ability to increase or decrease the back angle recline. We'll talk about back angle recline in a bit more detail when we come to the other chairs and can illustrate some of the issues with back angle recline. Sometimes more isn't better. So I'll bring the chair back into um, an upright position. Just to cover a bit on tilt and space while we're here. Um, when we're talking about um, fatigue management, tilt and space, as long as it's appropriate, because it's not safe and appropriate for everyone, there are instances where we shouldn't be prescribing tilt and space. Um, but where it is safe, it's a really good tool for fatigue management. Um, so we can take the strong effects of gravity away for a period and allow our clients to rest and recuperate. So then bring them back upright to be more engaging and um, functional again. Yeah. Um lift and recline chair, we've got two options for the lift section of the chair. One is 
typically what we call a push lift. So as the chair rises, it tilts forward. Client's feet are flat on the floor. The other option we have is what we call a flat lift or a vertical lift. So what happens there is that seat surface remains horizontal and just raises the client and the client can shuffle to the edge and just drop off the edge of the chair, not too far off the edge of the chair. Just gives them a little bit more support. Can be that your client has an issue with balance um, and, and perhaps that first motion that we looked at, that tilt, not tilt, sorry, that push lift may unbalance somebody. So it's just something to be aware of. This model of chairs called the Kingsbridge. You can see that we've got drop arms. So you may have somebody in a wheelchair who has the ability to side transfer. You can drop the arm down, a nice smooth surface to transfer across. Added complication now is that obviously when we measure for this type of chair, we measure seat to floor to make sure that our client is feet well supported when sitting upright. We may need to consider the height of the wheelchair that the person's transferring from. So it just adds that little bit of complexity. Um, we have various back styles. What we've got on the chair here is called a waterfall back, three separate cushions. We do a flat back, which is what it says on the tin, or a contoured back, like you see there on the on the um, grey chair, just that shaped back. Waterfall back tends to be the most popular, but I'd be careful with the waterfall back because what you have is a very comfortable back. You become absorbed into it. But the chances are your client or patient may fall asleep. There's very little lateral support in a waterfall back, okay? So that's where we'd suggest a lateral back. Again, if you need more detail on the individual accessories, have a little look on the website. I mean, you'll get a lot more detail on what we can provide there. Somebody with generalised weakness, if they are recovering uh, from COVID-19, may need that extra, as I said, that extra lateral support to remain upright and to promote physiological function. Um, so to make sure that they're not um, compressing any internal organs and digestion is as um, effective as it can be. And of course, respiration to make sure that we are keeping the trunk aligned and opening up the chest girdle, the shoulder girdle and chest. It's, you know, lift and recline chair is probably the most commonly seen type of specialist seating. And because of that, sometimes is misunderstood. We come back to look at the detail of pressure care and certain space and back angle recline with some of the other products. So I'm going to move up the range now to a, a, a chair that offers moderate uh, support, postural support. It's a tilt and space chair. So again, we have 30 degrees of tilt. Okay. I'm controlling that at the back of the chair with the lever, just squeeze and release where I want that client to sit. Um, the three chairs I have left, I'm going to be running through are manual chairs, but we do electric versions of those chairs as well. Okay, that will give the client a little bit more control, a little bit more independence. Powered options will give you control over tilted space. Um, back angle recline and leg rest elevation. Okay, and we'll talk about those different features on the other chairs. Really, when we come to the hydro tilt, we're pretty much looking at somebody who's going to be hoisted into this chair. Uh, when we use tilt in space for that client, we've got to be careful because as you can see, as I tilt the chair back, it takes the client's feet away from the floor. So we now start to use foot plate okay this is angle adjustable as well you can elevate the leg rest we can lengthen the leg rest as well if need be for taller clients the foot plates can be um, quite easily forgotten on specialist seats and they're actually they're a key part when it comes to pressure care 19 percent of our body weight goes through our feet as so we've been not supporting them, but we've then got extra weight going through the sacrum, possibly an increase in the risk. So um, when we're talking about supporting body segments, it's especially the feet. Yeah. And it's actually a more comfortable way to sit in a chair. I mean, if you have access to these chairs and you try the chair with and without a footplate, you think consciously of how it feels, chances are you'll feel more comfortable with the footplate. Um, moving up the chair, um, we can adjust the seat width and the seat depth on this chair to help with pelvic stability. 
So we get a nice snug fit to help prevent wind sweeping in the chair. Seat depth, we can adjust just by little mechanism at the back of the chair where we can prevent somebody from uh, sacredly sitting or posteriorly sitting. I'll just show you how I do that. I'm just going to turn the chair around. I guess a lot of you guys are going to be accessing um, equipment by equipment services, joint equipment stores, loan stores, community equipment services. Um, and you may need to reset uh, a chair for an individual. So something like the seat depth adjustment on the hydro tilt is something that's quite helpful for you guys to know about. When it comes to, especially with fatigue management, um, like I mentioned earlier, the key is to have all body segments stable and supported. And the way to do that is to get the seat dimensions sure. right. And actually, regardless of the outcomes of the postural assessment, somebody doesn't need any damage to the body systems to be negatively impacted by incorrect seating dimensions. Mm -hmm. So like Les said with seat depth, if somebody's seat depth, if it's not set up for them and it's too long, we can actually cause this posterior tilt and we're actually causing these issues. So it's one of the key things that we say to start off with, get the seat dimensions right, yeah. and then we can target the other body segments. It's key really, you know, the, the these chairs, the, the devil's in the detail, so to speak. You've got to understand how the chair works and how it adjusts to get the maximum benefit for your patient. So I just do this quickly. There's a little lever here, okay? I press that lever down. That takes a lock off this system. Press the lever down, grab the seat base, push away from me to increase the seat depth, bring towards me to decrease the seat depth, okay? And I'll show you that from the other side. It's really critical to get these measurements right because we can totally negate all the postural support if we don't get the, the seat depth and seat width correct. And that'll give us a seat depth range of 15 to 21 inches, okay? The seat width range on a medium hydro tilt is 15 to 20 inches. We do a bariatric version of the chair as well, which will go up to a 24 inch seat width and a 35 stone weight limit. I just want to show you um, what I call a hot tip. If you're accessing equipment through a joint equipment service, you may see one of these chairs, any of the chairs here in your store, and you want to reissue it to somebody. You'll need to check the specification, okay? On the back of every Careflex chair, there's a little silver label. I'm not sure if you can see that. Just here, okay? That's a unique serial number. If you can quote that to us, we can give you the exact specification of the chair that you have. From that, we can also work out if it may be something worth trying with your client. Okay, so the hot tip, whenever you see that number, make a note to it, it'll be really handy for you. What the number sig uh, is, signifies is that the product is actually a class one medical device. And as such, we need to have traceability with the products. Moving up the chair, lateral support, the different styles of lateral support for this chair. But what we're looking to do is to keep that person in the midline to help distribute pressure evenly. We could use a lateral support, an adjustable lateral on this chair, but quite often you may find that your client may find a lateral tucked in under you a little bit uncomfortable. So that word we use a lot on again in specialist seating is compromise. It's Contoured, deep contoured shape to the back helps to prompt that person to sit in that midline position. Yeah. And again, it's that balance between comfort, posture, and pressure care. Okay. It's just an option that we find very um, successful for lots of our clients. Moving up the chair, um, headrest. We have two or three different styles of headrest, but the main difference is a soft headrest, pillow headrest or a block foam headrest. With a soft headrest, we can open the padding up on the back, move the padding round so we shape, we can contour it to the patient's head. And Especially for clients who might be working with who again have this general weakness and they need the head support, not only for comfort, but for safety as well, to make yeah. sure that any activities swallowing, eating, drinking are, are safe. Yeah, so we can position the headrest either just behind the shoulders, or if you have somebody who may be a little bit sleepy, just pop that back 
and you see the headrest just envelops the head. Okay, it keeps me in that midline position. Um, just bring this back. So again, just to move up the range, we're going to look at a chair called the Hydroflex chair. Now this is a fantastic rehab chair, um, especially when we're thinking about recovery um, during during the pandemic and beyond. Um, and Les will demonstrate now, but if you imagine clients who are confined to bed for a period of time and maybe have developed um, prolonged uh, supine or lying postures, um, if they need to gradually um, get used to new sitting postures, um, then actually we can get a really good, uh, almost supine position from the chair. So the flex, <coughs> excuse me, again is a tilting space chair. But what I want you to look at is that forward angle. Okay, it's a slightly positive tilt, a negative tilt, positive tilt, negative tilt, anterior tilt, forward tilt, forward tilt. Easiest is best. Thirty degrees tilt back. Where this forward tilt helps is where your client is semi-ambulant. That person who can stand to walk but needs. A slightly higher level of postural support than perhaps you'd have with a lift and recline chair. So as I bring the chair forward, it'll bring their feet flat onto the floor. Okay. The other thing that's helpful, if my colleague Alex can give me a hand here, is that sometimes you'll find that we need to use some manual handling equipment to help somebody transfer into a chair. Because going back to what we mentioned, we still want to promote independence and function um, to make sure that we are getting the best out of our clients. Pop the brakes on. Bikes come forward. Alex can just drop the chair forward. You can see I can get into a much better position because of the angle of that chair. Okay. If you want to release me, Alex. With seating, the chair is only as good as the initial position within the chair. Uh, so the transfer itself is really key because we need to get that position right to make sure that the client remains in that position. So as well as tilting space, with that added level of postural support, we now have back angle reclaim as well. So if I put it in the perhaps maximum rehab setting, Elevating leg rest with a flip up foot plate. You imagine that this position that might be a lot more, might be more, a lot more tolerable for clients initially after yeah. a long period in so, bed. So, all the time we could be bringing that chair slightly more upright, closing the back angle as part of the rehab process to eventually. That person has the ability to stand independently transfer. Okay. As with tilt in space, back angle recline isn't going to be suitable for everyone either. So we do need to make sure we're risk assessing those things. Um, because back angle recline, even though it's fantastic in some situations, it can actually have a negative impact on pelvic stability if um if we don't um, address that first. Yeah. And we can illustrate this now, perhaps with this chair. Um You've also got to consider the effect on lateral support with a chair with back angle recline. So I've set this chair up so that its lateral support works quite well for me. My colleague Alex is going to come in. If you look at the position of the lateral support, okay, Alex is going to tilt me back first. If you look at what that lateral support is done to my arms, perhaps you can't see it, but I can feel it. It's actually drawn my arms out. Okay. It's really quite uncomfortable. I'll actually bring me back up, right? Now the chair's eating me. So yeah. if you imagine that Les hasn't got a postural control to be able to reposition. Yeah. I need to reposition myself. I need to be able to, to do that. Okay. It's just a consideration we need to have when we think about lateral support and back angle recline. And you think of that now perhaps with a lift and recline chair, which has linked up link mechanisms where the leg rest elevates as you tilt or recline the chair. And perhaps that client doesn't have that range of movement, can cause us problems. So we really need to think 
when we uh, assess for this kind of chair, we need to think of how tilt in space and back angle recline will affect our client. It's worth mentioning while we're here um, with back angle recline and tilt in space, um, in terms of pressure care, research has shown that when they're used in combination, it can be really effective in providing the both muscle and skin provision at the IT, so they show two brosses at the bottom of the pelvis. Um, so as long as it, they are suitable for the client, then sometimes tilt and space and back angle recline can be really good for pressure care. So looking at the last chair that we have today, it's a chair called the Smart Seat Pro. I just take the headrest off. I'll start this chair from the leg rest and the foot plate. I'm going to ask you to look at this section here as I elevate the leg rest, okay? Can you see that's extending, okay? Because we need to support the full length of a, of a client's leg as we elevate the leg rest. And this will allow us to do that. When you add a foot plate, that adjustment or that mechanism is even more important because without that happening, elevating the leg rest will elevate or will raise the client's upper leg of the seat surface. So if you think of one of the principles of pressure care that Rebecca mentioned earlier, we want to get as much of our client in contact with the chair as possible. So we need to consider if the client needs to elevate legs, and if they do, what kind of mechanism can we use? That's where this mechanism on the Smart Seat Pro is really helpful. Okay, so just demonstrate that again. You can see that there. Okay. So we have seat depth and seat width adjustment built into this chair. Can be adjusted from a 15 inch seat width to a 20 inch seat width and seat depth again can go from 15 to 21. So you can see the scope we have there for pelvic stability with different size clients and if you need to reuse and reissue this chair with a number of different clients. Back and head support Okay, we have four, we have a four section multi-adjustable back, a head, shoulder, thoracic, and lumbar. Each one can be adjusted in a similar way. So we have these little levers on the back. I turn those clockwise, anti-clockwise, that's anti-clockwise, isn't it? Yeah? And raise that perhaps for a taller client. Perhaps I have a more kyphotic client. Okay, I'll just drop this down. I know we're focusing on COVID-19 recovery, uh, but we need to remember the pandemic is going to be impacting on other individuals with non-COVID conditions as well. And we might have really complex clients with complex postures who are going to deteriorate from, um, from social from self-isolation or from reduced care packages. Um, so we need to be able to tailor to those and hopefully in, in, uh, improve their postures by adjust, yeah. multi-adjustable backs. And we can close and open the wings on each section as well. Okay, so that's our chair called the Smart Seat Pro. Now we've mentioned pressure care. All care for seating comes with built-in pressure care. It's called water cell technology, and it's rated medium to high. And when I say it's rated medium to high, we've had that uh, we've had an independent evaluation. To, to kind of give us um, backing for that claim. And that was carried out by Salford University. Again, if you check on our website, there's a link there that'll take you to an article uh, in a publication. Journal of Tissue Viability. The Journal of Tissue Viability. We've also got our own um, leaflets on, on, that uh, on that study as well, which we can send out to you, or you can download. So we've used this for 25 years. It's quite simple but effective. Um, what we have is a fabric for a stretch called Dartex, memory foam, a high elastic foam, and water cells. And quite simply, what happens is as 
the high pressure point, pressure ischial tuberosity, comes into contact with the seat surface, the top cover stretches and gives. It allows us to become absorbed into the cushion. The memory foam reacts to the body heat and contours to the body shape. The water cells just displace. So as I get a high pressure point, I sink into it, the surrounding surface rises and spreads pressure over a greater area. Okay, it's very straightforward. We don't sell the cushion separately. It's a component of our seating. It's a system approach, if you like, to pressure care. So as well as the surface you sit on, we use things like seat depth, seat width, foot support, leg support, head support, to ensure that we can sit somebody as symmetrically as possible to spread pressure over as great an area as possible. Okay. So that's our water cell technology cushion. Another great um, function as well is the auto tilt. I know we cover yeah. tilt in space. Um, so auto tilt, it's um, our kind of top end pressure care offering. So we've got a seat cushion, we've adjusted the chair for the individual to provide pelvic stability and to keep that person in the midline. Auto tilt is a regulated motion. So you have a handset, similar to this, you press it and the chair cycles through its range of tilt and space, okay? So we're tying those concepts together of the, the cushion, the pelvic stability, and actually moving that client. So gravity is affecting the client in a slightly different place. Not as quick as I'm doing here, but it's very gradual, but we'll move through its full range of tilt and space. And it promotes independence as well. If somebody wants to remain independent with yeah. chair use, the, um, they can rely on the chair to offer that rather than regular repositioning. Yeah. So, so that's our range. So um, how can we help? Um, we've been a manufacturer of seating for 25 years. Uh, we've a terrific amount of experience in providing solutions for a really wide um, spectrum of, of clients. Um, everything you see with us today is standard and off the shelf. We have a bespoke or customised solutions offering as well, uh, where we come up with some quite unique offerings for clients. Um, all the chairs are covered by warranty. Post 2018, there's a lifetime warranty on the frame of the chair. So again, coming back to that serial number, it's really quite important to make a note of that number. Um, we like to think of ourselves as a service provider as well. We're not just a box shifting company. Uh, we problem solve, we'll assess, we'll review. We like to become part of the team wherever possible. Um, that's about it for me. I'm going to pass you back to Rebecca now just to finish off and we'll come back towards the end. If you've got any questions, we'll try and answer those questions. Thank you, Les. Thank yeah, you. So it's a lot to fit into. It is a lot. I, I kind of yeah. point people back towards the website mm -hmm. if you've got any kind of queries on accessories. So just give us a call. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I mentioned um, that we um, love a holistic approach here. So I just wanted to really finish by um, giving you some resources if you don't already know of them. But the NHS has got a dedicated section um, on sleep and tiredness. And they also recommend this sleep station. Um, which is um, a, an accredited programme that can um, provide lots of insightful resources, a clinically validated sleep improvement programme. And of course, if we work with clients who are presenting with overwhelming fatigue that's affecting their daily life, then it might be worth them um, having those discussions with their GP as well. Now, ultimately, what we wanted to get across today was the importance of seating and managing somebody's posture during their recovery. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is to encourage good seated posture through an upright and stable position with a pelvis at the back of the chair, with the client as symmetrical as is possible for them, with the head aligned, the chest and shoulder girdle opened up to help with physiological function and the upper and lower limbs, including the feet, of course, fully supported. Now, there are going to be a range of different um, postural challenges, especially um, during COVID-19 and recovery. We don't quite know what's going to face, what kind of challenges we're going to face. Um, and that's why there's going to be an individualised basis. Carefax are still doing remote assessments as well as face-to-face, -face, um, um, full PPE. Um, and I know that um, Les is on about quite often. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, we, we've we've been assessing people yeah. through, right throughout the crisis, mm -hmm. if you like. For With a range of different things as we've seen yeah. that we don't quite know That's what right, challenges then. are coming. So. Yeah, it's a very unusual time as we're mm -hmm. all aware. Yeah. yeah. So I think we'll just open it up to questions. Yeah, now. so okay. if anybody has any questions, we'll open the mics and the videos back up. Uh, you've got a chat function there as well. Oh, wow. um, anybody got any questions? Fire away. Anybody out there? <laughs> Hello. I've got a question. Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. clearly. Um, I've got a lady who has quite advanced Parkinson's and uses a steady to transfer. She's got terrible neck flexion, a uh, neck posture, sorry, and lower limb posture, and is currently in quite a old riser recliner chair. Now, I felt that she'd need the Hydroflex, but I was concerned about success with transferring using the steady. Yeah. She's quite a short lady and and quite wide. So I sort of ruled it out on the basis that the steady wouldn't be um, a suitable transfer for the Hydroflex. But today you've shown me that negative angle. Yeah. Do you have much success with that, though, in reality? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does depend. It's a case, per, case by case. Um, situation really. Some people have a greater ability to, to contribute to that to that transfer and can help to readjust themselves. Um, it's the readjustment at the it's, end. It's the readjustment it? yeah. at the end, if you like, and it, it tends to be. Um, the lady I'm thinking of wouldn't be able to re bum shuffle, if you like, once you've got her in the chair. That's that, that's that's the exact term I was looking for. Bum shuffle. I was trying to find something slightly different, but that yeah. It's where we get somebody to here, and we need to get somebody to there. Yeah. But if, if we leave them there, or they'll end up in that kind of posture. Yeah. Right. So uh, I'm right to rule it out potentially. Uh, potentially, I mean, it's. I, I'd recommend an assessment. That's not just to try and sell a chair, but you don't really, really know if you try. If you try. No. Sometimes it's quite. Um, uh, quite surprising what we can achieve, yeah. uh, but it does depend on the individual how much they can actually contribute. And um, it may just be that we've got the optimum height and angle for that person to transfer in and out. It's it's a difficult one. Okay. The most difficult assessment I get involved with isn't necessarily the client with a scoliosis, a kyphosis, and a pelvic obliquity. It's the person you can still stand to transfer. I'm trying to encourage that. Yeah, I'm okay. trying to maintain that where. The lift and recline chair, if you like, has the functional ability to, to lift somebody into a standing position, but doesn't have the postural support that you'd have in a chair like a flex or a pro. Yeah. And it's trying to get that balance. It's a really difficult balance to, to, to meet. OK, I'll go back to the client then and see about arranging an assessment. They, we, yeah. we, we've put it off because of that being the problem, but I, I'll go back and see if they're open to trying it with us. So. I mean, Get, drop us an email, give us as much information as you can as the hip width and height and stress that you, you, you're looking to try a steady hoist with your client and we'll make sure that when we turn up, we, we can fully prep for that visit. Brilliant. OK, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Gone quiet. Yeah. You can always get in touch if anything pops to mind anyway afterwards you can always get in get in touch i don't think there's anything on the chat either no. no okay well if there is anything you you know how to get hold of us uh keep an eye on the website uh becca's writing blogs on a regular basis as well um anything client specific as well yeah yeah, or, yeah, yeah. if you have any client specific queries mm -hmm. Um, Becca's more than happy to help out with that. It's easy for me to say because I won't be doing it. But, um, yeah, if there is anything, please um, keep in touch and um, thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.